Thank you for joining us on Synthesis Workshop. On today's Research Spotlight episode, we're joined by Dr. Sebastian Peil. Sebastian earned his bachelor's degree at the Friedrich Schiller University Jena in Germany. He subsequently came to Leibniz University Hanover and completed his master's degree with Marcus Kalles. During that time, he did a research stay in the Hartwood Group at Berkeley. He then came to the Max Planck Institute, where he earned his PhD working in the Furstner Group. Currently, he works as a medicinal chemist at Grunenthal in Germany. And from there, I'll hand the floor over to you, Sebastian. Thank you very much for coming on today. Hi, Matt. Yeah, thanks a lot for your invitation and your kind introduction to this episode. So I'm going to present our latest work on using hydrogenation chemistry in combination with CH insertion reactivity of ruthenium carbene complexes to develop what we have called hydrogenative CH insertion reactions. So when you think about hydrogenation, this mode of reactivity comes to mind where hydrogen is added across some kind of unsaturated system, be it an olefin, an aldehyde, or an alkyne. And in all of those cases, the two hydrogen atoms of the hydrogen end up in vicinal positions or one-two related. And these kinds of reactions are some of the most well-established ones in organic chemistry with various different catalyst systems. And in contrast to that, Geminal hydrogenation is formally the addition of both hydrogen atoms to the same atom of the saturated for reasons has to have some kind of triple bond in it. So in an alkyne, if you add both hydrogens to the same acetylene carbon, you recount your electrons, you note that the second acetylene carbon has to be transformed into a carbene, which is, of course, quite unstable in its free state. However, if the catalyst which facilitates this kind of general delivery of the hydrogens is a metal which can also bind to the carbene in such a metal carbene complex, this intermediate is now much more stable and the overall reaction begins to look a little bit more reasonable. And specifically, the alkyne has to look like this, so a propargyl ether, and the catalyst is this CP star ruthenium chloride fragment, so that after geminal hydrogenation, such a ruthenium carbene complex is formed, which is additionally stabilized by this ether ligand. And this general reaction had been established already in 2015, and we then wanted to utilize this reactive carbene intermediates in further downstream reactivity. For example, we could show that tethering an olefin like this to our carbene resulted in a clean metathesis reaction, very much similar to an ordinary olefin metathesis by 2 plus 2 cycloaddition cycloreversion process. We then went on to apply this hydrogenative metathesis in the total synthesis of this small marine natural product, Zinurarone F, the precursor of which you can see here. So again, both hydrogens are added to this position, and then the carbene here cyclizes onto the distal olefin here, closing the cyclopentenone ring, which after Team S deprotection yields the racemic natural product. And during optimization of this key hydrogenative metathesis step, we also looked into protecting groups other than TMS on this tertiary propargyl alcohol. And very much to our surprise, we found that using SEM as the protecting group up here resulted in the formation of this product. Now, the formation of this THF here can be explained by the usual geminal hydrogenation followed by CH insertion of the carbene at this position to the CH bond of the acetal up here. We could follow up with some examples of this CH insertion via acyl carbenes, as exemplified in this case. So again, gem hydrogenation yields this carbene intermediate, and then this carbene inserts into the CH bond up here, closing the THF ring. And this was kind of proof of principle for this hydrogenative CH insertion reaction. However, the yields were only moderate, and we found that the ketone next to the carbene center was strictly required, so that even an ester or an emmet were not tolerated anymore. Looking into the literature then revealed that these acyl carbenes might not be the best intermediate for the desired CH insertion reactivity, and that very similar CH insertion reactions were reported from such vinyl carbene complexes instead, having an alkene next to the carbene center instead of a ketone. And these vinyl carbene intermediates are generally accessed by a process called carbene alkyne metathesis, where a diazo carbene precursor is first decomposed on a ruthenium complex to form such a primary carbene, which then adds across the alkyne in a 2 plus 2 cycloaddition process to form the vinyl carbene complex up here. And although this reported reaction is very interesting, there are some limitations in using carbene alkyne metathesis. That is, first of all, the diazo alkanes are potentially hazardous, and that also the only terminal alkynes in this step are tolerated. 
Also, the reaction typically yields the products in olefin EZ mixtures. So we wanted to combine our geminal hydrogenation to this known CH insertion reactivity of vinyl carbene complexes. So instead of decomposing diazoles, we wanted to generate the same intermediate by gem hydrogenation of the appropriate precursor, which has to look like this. So again, adding both hydrogens here, you generate the carbene at this position to yield this vinyl carbene. We were really happy to find that this worked out quite straightforwardly. So hydrogenation of such a substrate under typical conditions from our previous projects led to a clean formation of this THF here in high yield. Before exploring the scope of this reaction, we conducted a series of mechanistic experiments to gain a more detailed understanding of the reaction. And using the corresponding deuteromethyl ether variant yields the product where deuterium is exclusively distributed across these two positions. And then hydrogenation with deuterium gas leads to the expected gem deuterated product THF here. And we could not detect any scrambling of the THF hydrogens under our conditions, which suggests a fairly well-defined reaction mechanism and likely no hidden mechanistic complexity. We also confirmed that the vinyl group in our carbene complex is crucial for CH insertion reactivity by comparison of these three substrates with either higher or lower degree of unsaturation next to the alkyne, which don't show any THF product formation. So this really highlights that only the intermediate vinyl carbene complex you saw on the previous page is competent to insert into the CH bond of the methyl group and that either benzylic or alkyl carbenes do not undergo CH insertion. To understand why that is, and also to get a better understanding of the CH insertion step, we wanted to observe our key ruthenium vinyl carbene intermediate. And for that, we ran the stoichiometric reaction with this model substrate at low temperature, and were in fact able to observe two interconverting carbene species at minus 80 degrees. So the more usual carbene species, this eta-1, vinyl carbene complex shows a carbon NMR resonance at 308 ppm, which is fairly typical for this kind of piano stool carbene structure, additionally stabilized by ligated oxygen ether here to from the saturated 18 electron complex. However, we also found that this eta-3 vinyl carbene complex to be the slightly favored isomeric carbene, and it shows a marked upfield shift of both the carbene and the olefin carbon signals, clearly indicating that the binding of the vinyl pi system to the metal center. Now, in combination with experiments shown at the previous slide, this suggests that it is this eta-3 vinyl carbene complex which is the competent intermediate toward CUH insertion. And these rapidly interconverting carbene complexes are quite unstable at room temperature or above as they decompose by inserting into the CH bond of the metal ether. Now, this decay follows first order kinetics, as you would expect for such an intramolecular process, with a Gibbs activation energy of around 23 kcal per mole. We were also able to generate independent rate KIE values by measuring the CH insertion rates, starting from the preformed carbene complexes in the proteo or deuteromethyl ether variant. So at room temperature, the KIE was determined to be 3.7. However, we also measured independent rate KIEs at temperatures above and below room temperature, which showed that the kinetic isotope effect in this reaction is in fact temperature dependent. And I won't go into the details on how exactly to interpret this, which you can learn more about this very insightful review if you are interested. But suffice to say that this temperature dependence of the KIE suggests that the CHC angle at the CH insertion transition state is fairly obtuse. And this almost linear geometry in turn is very much consistent with the previously calculated hydride transfer-like transition state so that essentially a hydride is transferred to the carbon center first, which generates a partial positive charge here and a partial negative charge at this carbon center before the species collapses to form the THF ring. And it is this exact partial positive charge at the CH donor site which explains why an oxygen atom is needed right next to stabilize the buildup of positive charge in a way as you would think about an oxocarbenium ion. Now, starting to look at the scope of this hydrogenated CH insertion transformation, this page is really just to highlight the structural diversity which you can obtain by this method. So you can generate various spirocyclic THFs, vinyl silanes, this type of locked amino acids, 
You can prepare proline type structures, cyclopentanes, spiroacetals, or these bridged bicyclic scaffolds. And just looking at all of these structures, it might not be immediately obvious how to arrive at those. So I will elaborate a little bit more on the substrates and reaction. So first, tying back the two propargyl substituents in a ring will result in a spirocyclic motif after THF formation. So again, hydrogen is added here, and then this carbene will bite into the CH bond to close the ring. And next, we wanted to see what would happen if we protected the propargyl alcohol as the team as ether. And redrawing the substrate in a more suggestive way shows that there's another potentially activated position inside the THP ring next to the oxygen. And we are really happy to find that in this case, this bridged THP forms in quite good yield as well. So this divergent reactivity can be extended to more substrates shown here to make either the spirocyclic or the bridged scaffold, depending on whether you use the methylated or the TMS protected propargyl ether. Next, having a more detailed look at the acetal series shows that this MOM protected substrate here to yield the corresponding methoxy THF and by analogy, the THP protected variant yields this spiroacetal type structure and propargylic substituents like here to prepare either this or this spiral acetal, depending on whether you use methoxy or isopropoxy acetals. Propargylic protected ketones react as well, and the carbene inserts into the activated CH bond of the diol part to yield the bridged acetals here. And similarly, this product is formed from the corresponding dimethyl acetal substrate. Going even further, this example shows that insertion into the CH bond of an ortho ester is facile as well and yields this product, which easily hydrolyzes in acid to the corresponding lactone. And when protected propargyl alcohols are substituted with protected propargyl amines, these proledines can be obtained. And notably, also this proline derivative by insertion into the glycine type substrate. So as you've got a feeling on how the reaction works, now I would go through the tolerated substitutions at all positions in the product a little bit more systematically, starting at the substituents flanking the reactive CH bond. And this CH bond can be primary, secondary, or tertiary, and with additional electron withdrawing ester groups or electron donating alkoxy groups in the vicinity. And the primary activating group can be oxygen or Bock and tosyl protected nitrogen. And combinations of those with electron withdrawing or electron donating groups are in reach as well. And the activating atom doesn't have to be inside the newly formed ring, but can also be exocyclic as well, in which case you form such a cyclopentane. The propargyl substituents can be acyclic or cyclic, in which case the products are these spiro THFs. And all 5.6, 5.5, and 5.4 systems can be generated with either all carbon, oxygen, or nitrogen in the attached ring. And when this substituent here is connected to the CH donor substitute up here, you can access those bridge ring scaffolds as shown before. Finally, looking at the alkene substitution, we could use terminal, internal, or cyclic olefins, as well as vinyl silates, protected allylic or homoallylic alcohols, and then also these easily functionalizable allylic acetal or ester groups. And particularly, the high yield of this product here demonstrates the quite mild and neutral reaction conditions. The typical procedure to prepare the shown spirocyclic products start with a quite straightforward substrate synthesis in which the lithiated E9 here is added into your ketone of choice, and then the alkoxide is trapped with methyl iodide in the same pot to yield the substrate in good yield. And then afterwards, cyclization to the spiro THF is done in this overall two step sequence. And as you would expect, hydrogenation reactions generally scale reasonably well, and we could obtain more than a gram in essentially the same yield as before over those two steps. And at first glance, this isopropenyl substituent might look a little difficult to use for further functionalizations. However, you can use the olefin to access the obvious metal ketone by ozonolysis, this tertiary alcohol by Mukayama hydration, or this chain extended product by hydrogen atom transfer and radical 1,4 addition. And moreover, this isopropenyl group has been shown to be a hidden surrogate for ketones, tempo adducts, or sulfones by radical CC bond fragmentations developed by the Quan group.
Notably, it, it has also been shown that this motif can be used in a reaction term dealkinylative coupling to attach arenes to this sp3 center under nickel catalysis. And on the other hand, you might also want to get rid of the isopropenol group altogether in such a hydro dealkinylation reaction. And lastly, the very same two-step access to this spirocyclic THF can be extended to obtain such a per-deuterated THF core by simply using per-deuteromethyl iodide in the first step and deuterium gas in the second step. And in the context of medicinal chemistry, this deuterated analog might be useful if you're trying to improve the metabolic stability of such a scaffold or to use as an internal standard in MS experiments. With that, I would conclude this overview on hydrogenated CH insertion with this summary of tolerated substituents on the substrate and product. As with any method, there are a range of advantages and disadvantages, of course. So on the plus side, there's certainly the commercial availability of the catalyst, and then easy reaction setup and straightforward substrate synthesis plays a big role in the user friendliness, I would say. Also, the reaction conditions are quite mild, and you can access diverse three-dimensional scaffolds. And again, the olefin part of the substrate, which you need for the reactivity of the vinyl carbene intermediate, has to be removed or further functionalized. And the biggest limitation in scope is the necessity of this quaternary center in the propagylic position. In certain cases, the diastereoselectivity selectivity of the reaction is hard to predict, and the overall disconnection might be not so easy to recognize in your molecule, especially if you look at the bridge ring systems as these CH insertion reactions in general are a little bit disconnected to chemical intuition, I would say. So if there is anything to remember of this talk, it might be this picture on how to recognize the hydrogenated CH insertion reaction. Finally, I have to thank Matt again for setting up this super useful synthesis workshop project and the kind invitation. And Concerning our research as a team, I have to highlight Professor Fürstner for his supervision of the project and Alejandro for his preparative synthetic work, Markus for his contributions on the complex mechanistic NMR experiments, as well as all the past and present members of the Fürstner group in the various departments of the Institute for their great support in keeping the ideas coming and maintaining all the excellent infrastructure at the NPI. Thank you for watching this Research Spotlight episode, and thank you to Sebastian for joining us to share your work. If you enjoyed the episode, you can support us by subscribing or telling your peers about this podcast, and feel free to send us any questions or comments you have. Follow us on Twitter to stay up to date, and see you all next time.